majesty Let creation bow Let creation bow And hail you as the
is like you, Lord, faithful and true. You bring your people through the seas. Who is like you? Who is like you, Lord? Renews my 
G'day and welcome to Barney's Online. It's the last week of the school holidays and I hope you've been encouraged as we looked at the resurrection. Today we're doing something special, a little bit different. Our Assistant Minister Adam Richards is taking us on a whirlwind tour of the book of Obadiah in the Old Testament. I don't know if you know much about Obadiah, but today you'll become an expert on it. It's only a one chapter long book and Adam's going to help us think through what it means that God speaks about a people who aren't his people and about what they've been up to and it's not all good news. And, uh, but I hope you'll find it encouraging that God is a God who is just. He's a God who is for us.
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Old Testament that it is as much your word as the new. And we thank you for the way that it teaches us about your character. Father, we pray that today we might learn to stand in awe of you, to know both your uh, promises of hope, but also how seriously you take sin and you take the mockery of your people. Father, please be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Mitchell. I usually go to the 7 p.m. service at Barney's, and today I'm going to be reading the Bible. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of Obadiah. The vision of Obadiah. This is what the Lord God has said about Eden. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy has been sent among the nations. Rise up and let us go to war against her. Look, I will make you insignificant among the nations. You will be deeply despised. Your arrogant heart has deceived you. You who live in clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. If thieves came to you, if marauders by night, how ravaged you would be. Wouldn't they steal only what they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, wouldn't they leave some grapes? How Esau will be pillaged, his hidden treasures searched out. Everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive and conquer you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you. He will be unaware of it. In that day, this is the Lord's declaration, will I not eliminate the wise ones of Edom and those who understand from the hill country of Esau? Temen, your warriors, will be terrified so that everyone from the hill country of Esau will be destroyed by slaughter. You will be covered with shame and destroyed forever because of the violence done to your brother Jacob. On the day you stood aloof, on the day strangers captured his wealth, while foreigners entered his city gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were just like one of them. Do not gloat over your brother in the day of his calamity. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Do not boastfully mock in the day of distress. Do not enter my people's city gate in the day of their disaster. Yes, you. Do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster, and do not appropriate their possessions in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off their fugitives, and do not hand over their survivors in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near against all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on your own head. As you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and gulp down and be as though they had never been. But there will be a deliverance on Mount Zion, and it will be holy. The house of Jacob will dispossess those who dispossess them. Then the house of Jacob will be a blazing fire, and the house of Joseph a burning flame. But the house of Esau will be stubble. Jacob will set them on fire and consume them and consume Eden. Therefore, no survival will remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will possess the hill country of Esau. Those from the, from the Judea foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will possess the territories of Ephraim and Samaria, while Benjamin will possess Gilead. The exiles of the Israelites who are in Hala and who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, as well as the exiles of Jerusalem, who are in Sephard, will possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors will ascend Mount Zion to rule over the hill country of Esau, but the kingdom will be the Lord's. Commands all the hosts of heaven. Who else? Can
could make every king bow down. Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy forever. Worship the Holy God. What are the glory consumes like fire? What are the power can raise the dead? What are the name remains undefeated? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to read your word. We pray, Father, as we come to understand the letter of Obadiah, strengthen us, help us to understand its message of hope in amongst your judgment, that we might live for your sake and glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I continue to walk in my Christian life, I'm always wondering, why does the Christian church appear so weak? Our churches seems so small in comparison to our communities. Christians seem to be struggling to make headway in the culture. Our society continually disregards or ignores our message. Yes, by and large, Sydney Anglicans preach a very faithful and godly message, as do many other churches and denominations throughout this city and across this nation. Yet Christians are largely ignored. Worse yet, the society as a whole, basically ignores what God has to say in his word. Politicians ignore us, society silences us, and the culture often disdains us. Yes, 
Sure, society will often tolerate Christians as long as we don't say anything that might offend it. But if we say what we believe, we can be vilified, ostracised or even fired for hate speech. The Christian church appears weak. And so we as Christians can be discouraged by the way things seem. The state of the church looks dire. And as we look at the culture, we can think it's hopeless. Australia looks down upon us. There is nothing we can do. Today we are looking at Obadiah's vision from God as he speaks to the nation Israel. And now this is the smallest book in the Old Testament and this is given to Israel when things for the nation seem at their bleakest, seem at their direst hour. And God's message to the Israel, God's word to Israel, to this nation at this time is, do not lose hope. Do not give up, despite how things will look. Despite how bad things seem, God will prevail. To understand this vision from from God to Obadiah, we do need to know some of the context and some of the historical background of what is going on here. God sends this vision to Obadiah, uh, to Israel from Obadiah, at the point in history where Israel has been destroyed by the Babylonians. Israel has been continually in rebellion against Israel, uh, against God and God has been sending prophet after prophet and saying, repent, turn, and Israel has ignored the message. And finally, God has sent Babylon in and destroyed the nation and Israel is being carted out of the land and has been taken to the Babylonian Empire. And God is saying to the Israelites at this point in time, this vision comes to them and God is saying, do not lose hope. And he says it in a very strange way by preaching and telling the Israelites about their brother, about the nation of Edom. And the Edomites, as I just said, well, as I was saying, were descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. And that is the context of this letter. God is sending a vision to Obadiah about Esau, about Edom. And he's telling the Israelites what will happen to Edom, what will happen to this brother of theirs who has treated them badly so that they will not lose hope. And he does that through three points that the letter makes to teach Israel to give Israel hope. And the first thing that we learn, the first point that comes out from the letter that comes out in this vision is that God will judge the pride of the nations. God will judge the pride of the nations. The vision opens with a picture of Edom and it shows where Edom is placing its trust. They place their trust in their position, in their strength. They are a nation that's located to the east of the Israelites and they're located in the hill country and it's a rocky uh, hill country. And the reason why they're there is they're thinking, well, we're surrounded by rocks, we're surrounded by a fortress, we are safe in our rocks. And if you want to understand just how uh, safe and impenetrable their rocks were, if you've ever seen the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and you see Indiana at the end of the movie is walking through this narrow ravine and it opens up into this canyon and there's this magnificent temple in front of them. That is in the country of Edom, that that area. And what you see on the screen is how it looks in actuality if you go to the city of Petra today. It's this narrow ravine leading into the, the city and it was a very defensible choke point. Edom was placing its trust in the place where it was in the rocks because it says, well, no one can get us here. We're safe. We're protected. And this is what God says to Edom in verse 3. Your arrogant heart has deceived you, you who lived in the clefts of the rock, in your home on the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring me to the ground? 
Edom is trusting in its strategic position. It's saying, well, no one, no military can get us here. We are safe. We can be safe of our position. And they're taking pride in their position. They're taking pride of where they stand. And God says, you are being arrogant. You think your safety, you think your fortress in the rocks will protect you? It will not. You have placed your pride in the wrong thing, Edom. But that is not the only place they've placed their pride. We also see that they've placed their pride in their alliances. And this is what God says in verse 7. Everyone who has a treaty with you will drive you to the border. Everyone at peace with you will deceive and conquer you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you. He will be unaware of it. So God is saying to Edom, all those alliances, all those strategic partnerships you have created for yourself, all those, those military mites that you think will protect you, no, they will be turned against you. Your fortresses will not stand. So this is what man does. We look at our situation, we build our little nest eggs and our little security and we think, ha, I will be safe. I will be protected in this area. This is my safe place and no one can get me. And God says, no. Wherever you place your pride, whatever you think is your strength, I will bring it down. No one will protect you from me. God knows what we are like. God knows we place and like to place our security in the things of this world. We think the things will, in this world will stand against his might and more importantly that it will stand against his judgment. And God says no. We read in verse 10, you will be covered with shame and destroyed forever because of violence done to your brother Jacob. God is saying to Edom, you are going to be brought down. You will be shamed. Wherever you've put your hope, your judgment will be completely and utterly against you and you will be destroyed. And you see in that last little section, you hear that little echo and this is why you need to understand that Edom is the descendants of the brother. Esau of Jacob's brother because of violence done. See, what the Edomites had done as Israel had been destroyed, and you see this in the letter, is that they watched on with joy as Israel was destroyed. They may have participated, but they certainly profited from the destruction of Israel. They gloated over their destruction. Instead of mourning for their brother, instead of looking at the situation and caring for Jacob, as the refugees fled out of the nation, they handed them over to the Babylonians. They had no care. They had no love. They sought to destroy, profit and gloat over what happened to Israel. They were thought themselves safe. They thought themselves secure. They thought themselves well, the Babylonians will never get, get against us. We have our treaties. We have our fortresses. We will be safe. And what God is saying to Edom is this. No, I will bring you down. But not only will I bring you down, you should know better. And Edom should have known better. They should have remembered their history. They should have remembered where they came from. God is saying to the nation, you know your brother Jacob, you came from his very loins, you shared a father who was Isaac. And when your brother was destroyed, instead of caring for him, you overjoyed in seeing his destruction. You gloated over him, you profited from his destruction. How many times in the biblical narrative have we seen brothers betraying brothers? From the very first brothers, Cain and Abel to Joseph and his brothers, where his brothers send Joseph and sell him into slavery in Egypt. It is a common theme throughout the scriptures that the brothers sell each other out. And here Esau sells out Jacob. And God holds Esau 
Edom accountable, to know its history, to know that it is brother, it is the brother of Israel, to know where it came from. Edom is supposed to know its history. Why does this apply? Because Christianity is about history. The Bible records God's historical interaction with his people to save them. God saves his people. God interacts, intervenes in history so as to deliver his people. And the Bible records this salvation narrative over and over again. That is the reason we study the Bible, because the, God reveals himself as he delivers his people throughout history. And as God reveals himself through the narrative, as he shows us who he is, we are called to respond to that character, to that nature, to that salvation. In the case of Edom, as descendants of Esau, God expects them to know their history and he expects them to respond to the plight of the Israelites. Instead, they metaphorically stand above their brothers and scoff at their plight. They took pride in their fortresses and alliances and they thought themselves uh, safe from a similar fate. Instead of learning from history, they have forgotten it. And God says, I will bring you down, as I will bring down the rest of the nations. Wherever the nations take their pride, that is where I am going to bring them down. Whatever we value, where we find our security, if it is anything other than God, then on the day of judgment, it will not stand. Which brings us to the second part and the central feature of this letter. And it comes in verses 15 to 18. And it's simply this. God manifests his power in the weakness of his people. God manifests his power in the weakness of his people. Reading from verse 15. And I want you to hear it through the ears and think of yourself as an Israelite who's been dis dispossessed from your nation as you leave your land that is on fire. For the day of the Lord is near against all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on your he own head. As you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and gulp down, and, as, and it be as though they had never been. But there will be a deliverance on Mount Sion, and it will be holy. The house, the house of Jacob will dispossess those who dispossess them. Then the house of Jacob will be a blazing fire, and the house of Joseph a burning flame, but the house of Esau will be a stumble. Jacob will set them on fire and consume Edom. There will Therefore no survivor will remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Israel has been destroyed. The nation is in ruins. But God says to them, I have judged you because of what I have done. But look on, though I have judged you as my people, though the nations might look on you and despise you, their time is coming and things will be reversed. As the nations look at Israel, as Edom looks at Israel, it looks like it's being totally wiped from the earth. But God says, I will turn this around. Look at verse 17. But there will be a deliverance on Mount Zion. You mean that mountain, that hill with the temple that's now a, bio, a giant pile of rubble, a deliverance is going to come from there, you're going to deliver Israel from that city that is destroyed. Are you, are you mad? But that is what the point of the letter is about. God is saying things are not as they appear. Instead of being dispossessed as slaves, they will be the possessors and the masters. Instead of being put to flames, they will be a flame that burns all before them. And it's a play on words, but God is saying to Israel, things look dire, things look bleak. You might be dispossessed, 
but God will turn things around. It looks incredible. It doesn't look possible. How can God do this? How is God going to bring deliverance from Jerusalem, especially now the city and the temple don't exist? But God says, and God is going to do, God will manifest his power in the weakness of his people. Personally, I find this a very hard and strange idea to accept. I don't know about you. I don't like weakness. I don't like to feel weak. I don't like the idea that others have power over me. I was bullied terribly as a child. And so, and I don't say this to generate sympathy. I say this because I know what it's like to be a victim. I know what it feels like to be powerless, to feel humiliated and mocked. And I've got to be honest, I don't want to go back there. It's a horrible feeling. And then I hear and I'm reminded, but God manifests his power in the weakness of his people. God displays his strengths just when people feel at their lowest, at their weakest, when they feel like they can do nothing. Now, our, we need to be careful at this point. Our culture has turned victimhood as just another means for a power grab. Our culture uses victimhood as a means of attaining power and it's a wrong thing to do as it mocks real victimhood. But true weakness, true powerlessness means being compu- completely humiliated. It means being at a loss of control of your situation and your circumstances. True weakness means I don't know where to turn. I don't know which way to go. And as you think about Israel, that's the situation they're in. They're being led out of their land. They are slaves of a foreign power. Their nation that God had promised them is in rubble. Where are they to go? Who are they to turn to? And God says, everything as that looks now will be reversed. You might things look, think things look dire, but I will change them around. Trust me, things are not as they seem. And here comes the incredible promise and the third aspect of this letter. You've got to remember, this is being said to a nation that has just lost their kingdom. And God says this, that his kingdom, the one that is to come, God's kingdom will stand forever. Reading from verse 19. People from the Negev will possess the hill country of Esau. Those from the Judean foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will possess the territories of Ephraim and Samaria. That while Benjamin will possess Gilead, the exiles of the Israelites who are in Hala and who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, as well as the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Zarephath, will possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors will, will ascend Mount Zion to rule over the hill country of Esau and the kingdom will be the Lord's. At the start of this sermon, I painted a deliberately dire picture And it's often how we view the church as being weak and that society is against us. And that's how often we see how uh, the society portray Christians in the church. It's dying. The society is becoming less Christian. But if you look at the data, yes, the society is becoming less Christian if you look at the census, but not by a whole lot. From 2006 to 2011, the number of people who claiming to be Christian moved from 64 to 61%. And when you look at those who were attending churches, the number didn't change. When you look at the Sydney Diocese or the Sydney City in 2011, the number of people claiming to be Catholic was 28.3 and Anglican 16.1. That means roughly 44% of the city 
claim some sort of Christian affiliation. That means roughly a little less than 50% of these of people that you meet in Sydney claim to be Christian. One in two. Now, I know not everybody who claims to be Christian is Christian. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, and my point isn't about demographics, is things are not always as they appear. I know the church has challenges. I'm not underlying or not denying that. But the future doesn't belong to secularism or atheism. In fact, nearly every demographic study I've seen across the globe shows that atheism is on the decline across the globe. And my point is this. Things aren't always what they seem. And when it comes to the future, there is nothing more true than this. The future belongs to God. History belongs to God. How many times have you heard the phrase, history is on our side? You know what they're really saying? God is on our side. Let me tell you, God is on God's side. And the question is, are you on God's side or are you against God? But history is on God's side. And God is driving history towards his purposes. God is not going to fail. He wants the Israelites to know that and he wants us to know that. God is not going to fail. God's kingdom will stand forever. And no better case, no better point comes up than really where the nation of Edom ends. Because this is not the last time in the Bible Esau and Jacob meet. They meet at another very important point in history. See, they meet at the point of Jesus' trial and crucifixion. Herod, who put Jesus on trial, was an Edomian or an Edomite. As you see Jesus stand before Herod, you see the brothers of Isaac, Jacob and Esau. And the brother Jacob is whipped and scorned and bleeding and mocked. And he stands silently condemned by Esau. And that brother went to the cross and he died for the sins of his people. In apparent weakness, God showed his strength and delivering his people for the forgiveness of their sins. The vision of Obadiah points to Christ. It points to what Jesus has done for us. As we look at this letter, we are reminded that we should place our hope that God will judge the nations, that God will manifest his power in the weakness of his people, and that God's kingdom in doing so will stand forever. And it calls on Christians to put their trust and their hope in what Jesus has done for them. My hope and my prayer for you this day as you read this letter, as you look at this world, is to not look at the world and think, oh, all is hopeless. The world is against us. The world may be against us, but God is for us. And if God is for us, then nothing in the world will ever stand against us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he died upon the cross to forgive us our sins. We know, Father, that history is on your side, that you will not fail to bring about your purposes and your promises, that your kingdom will come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray, Father, that we will come to trust in your promises to us through Jesus, knowing that you will not fail and that we'll put our hope and our trust in him forever and ever. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, next week we start on 2 Corinthians and we're picking up from chapter 8. How is it that Jesus on the cross uh, shows us not just the way of salvation and provides that for us, but starts to provide a model for us in all sorts of different areas of life? We'll be talking about the hip pocket and about generosity as we learn from the Lord Jesus and his example. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, as we start on our fourth term journey through the end of the book of 2 Corinthians, which we started last year. I hope it's going to be really stimulating. If you haven't read through the first half, maybe you can do that this week. Hi, it's uh, Ken here, and I'm going to pray for us. So if you've got your brown books, remember those from church? We're going to be on page 13. We'll say the Lord's Prayer together. But we'll do that at the end. I'll just pray uh, for a number of matters to do with the world, a country and uh, a church. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that the world is in your hands, that even though we see chaos and discord, um, human sinfulness, we know that ultimately you are in control. Father, we pray that you would bring justice to our world. Uh, we pray that you would uh, put in place men and women who seek peace and seek uh, the good of all. We pray for elected officials. We pray for the US, for China, the Middle East and Europe, where there are issues uh, with disease, um, power struggles, uh, hatreds, um, migrants and all sorts of other issues. Father, we know that it is beyond our ability to control or to uh, influence these, but we know, Father, that you're in control. So we ask that you might work in the hearts of men, that you might bring peace. We f pray also, Father, that the world would hear about Jesus, uh, that there would be no impediments to your gospel going out and people uh, being reconciled to you. Father, we think of Australia. We pray for wisdom for our leaders. We thank you that generally our government is good and wise. But we pray, Father, particularly with uh, COVID-19 and uh, each of the states with various uh, restrictions, the impact on the economy of the uh, lockdowns, etc. We thank you for uh, the JobKeeper and other government um, uh, initiatives. We just pray, Father, that you will give our, uh, our governing body's wisdom to know uh, when to open up, when to close down, uh, when to provide economic stimulus. And uh, we just do pray, Father, that, that this uh, disease would be controlled. We pray for a virus that would be successful in um, uh, preventing uh, death and destruction that uh, seems to be uh, worldwide. Father, we think uh, about a church here in Ingleburn. We just pray for uh, our leaders. We pray for wisdom, uh, particularly as we think through how to meet together uh, both online, um, in uh, electronic means, in people's homes, and ultimately coming back together as a church. Father, we pray that you would give us wisdom to know how to do that in a way that is safe and uh, that looks after people who are vulnerable. We pray, Father, for creativity for the ministry team and for the wardens and the parish council, that we would know how best to respond uh, to how things are going uh, in New South Wales. Um, we pray also for Victoria under lockdown. We pray for uh, the, the issues with mental health that uh, people must be facing under those sorts of restrictions. Father, we think of our families. We pray that as we... Uh, unable to move as freely as we would want, that uh, families uh, might use this time well, that you would create greater bonds within families. And Father, we pray that you would uh, grant us patience with each other as we live in frustrating times. We pray for each of us, Father. We pray for those who are extroverted and find the inability to uh, meet uh, frustrating Please give us patience uh, there. Father, we pray also for those who are perhaps more introverted that we would not be uh, come selfish and self-centred. Um, 
We ask, Father, that we will continue to look out for each other, uh, maybe through phone calls or other electronic means, if not in person. We pray all these things, Father, because we know that you are good, that you're in control, and you uh, give wisdom to all who ask. So we do pray uh, for that. Amen. Okay, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together, page 13. Let's do that now. The Lord be with you and also with you. So let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
your patient love. Hear our hearts, hear our minds, hear the echoes of the words we cannot find. Be our hope, be our guide, in our wanderings of weakness break our pride. Not for ease shall we pray, but for strength with you this day. So we pray in faith, your will be done, as we long to see your kingdom Father, you are a God who is holy and just. We thank you for your character and that you will not let sin go on. Father, we pray that our hearts will be chastened as we've heard about your justice and about your punishment for those who would mock your people. Father, we pray for the good news of Jesus to go forward, that it be transforming our lives, that we might cling to the hope that we have, and we look forward to the salvation that is to come and when all this injustice in the world will be over. But we pray now for your mercy on those around us, those we, our neighbours, our friends, our family, those we've yet to come into contact, our whole area. Father, we pray that you would pour out your spirit, that your gospel might go forward, that we would be bold to proclaim the forgiveness and mercy that are in the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope that everyone can have if they'll but turn to him and stop their rebellion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you've been challenged today as we thought through the book of Obadiah and it's given you lots to think about and to pray about. Let's finish with the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Lord, he is my 
shepherd There's nothing that I need He hath dealt with all my sin I'll lay in pastures green I'll walk beside the peaceful waters So he renews my life Keeps me on the straightest path Glory to God on high Though I walk through darkest valley I will feel no danger there For I know that you are with me Upon you I'll cast my cares Amen.